Welcome to the John Brown University Chapel podcast, recorded in the historic Cathedral of the Ozarks in Salem Springs, Arkansas. This week's chapel message is from President Chip Pollard. Prior to coming to JBU in 2004, he taught English at Calvin College and practiced law in Chicago. Good morning, welcome back. It is wonderful to have you here and worshiping together. As you well know, we are celebrating our 100th anniversary this year. And in keeping with that celebration, our theme for this uh, semester is that we're going to preach the windows. These windows were designed by a former uh, art professor named Alice Thornton, and they were produced by a, art, um, a glass company in Tulsa. There are 10 windows around, and they, each of them follow the same pattern. On the lower part of the window is some part of the history of JBU, and on the upper part is about the life of Christ. Uh, through the generous gift of some faculty, staff, board members, and others, we've actually created a new window. The new window's right up there. Um, and we've installed it. It's all there. It's ready. But we're going to leave it covered for three months. So why? I know boo, hiss. No booing, hiss. No booing and hissing in chapel. That's not allowed. Uh, and we're going to unveil it on Advent. December 10th, the last chapel of the semester. And we're waiting for a couple of reasons. One, there's a theological and historical order to these 10 windows, and we wanted to preach those 10 before we showed the new one. Second, the image, I showed it to you last spring, the image on the new window is actually of the second coming of Christ, which is actually the focus of the Advent season in December. We celebrate Christ's coming, the nativity, in Advent, but we really are celebrating and we're really having expectation for Christ to come again. So he thought it would be good to build some expectation for Advent and unveil the window and that last chapel. And third, we're trying to figure out some way to end this celebration. We thought showing the window would be a good way to do it at the end of the semester. So come back on December 10th and you'll see the 11th window. Today we're going to focus on this window here, to my right, your left. It is the window that I'll put up on the screen as well. Mm, I'll try to put it on the screen. There we go. Um, it is the window that depicts on the top uh, Christ's nativity, and on the bottom it, it tells the story of the conversion of John Brown Sr., the founder of our school. Scripture should always inform what we do here in chapel, so I have chosen uh, the Gospel of John's account of nativity as our scripture today. So hear with me the Gospel of Christ in John 1, 1 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, And the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness. To bear bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light. But he came to bear witness about the light. The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who received him who believed in his name he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood nor the will of the flesh nor the will of man but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory. Glory as the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. This is the word of God. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart, O Lord, be be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Let's begin with the uh, lower part of the window. John Brown Sr. was born in 1879, 140 years ago. His father had fought in the Civil War for the Union Army, and his mother came from a Quaker family. His parents were married just after the war. Brown grew up in a Christian home and with a Christian family, and he was early in his life, he was singing in the choir at church. The family was large nine people in the family, and they were poor. Brown left school at 11 
to go get a job to help with his family's need. And his first job was as a farmhand. He worked for a week and made $4, $4 a week. And he worked from sunup to sundown. By the time he was 17, like some young people, he had drifted away from the moral and religious convictions of his family to the point when he announced to his family that he was going to move to Arkansas, his father replied, that boy will never amount to anything. We just as well let him go. He traveled to Rogers, Arkansas with his brother Ben, who had purchased a fruit farm in the area. Brown continued to make his money through hard labor. First he cut and hauled railroad ties. Then he would crush lime with sledgehammers and haul it to the kiln. And then he worked as a fireman. We're beginning to pay now $1 a day in Rogers, Arkansas. He was 17 and in a very wet and chilly night in the May of 1897, Brown went out to dinner with friends from the lime kiln. He stepped outside the cafe to smoke a cigarette. And he started to hear a someone singing and the beat of a bass drum. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. It's my story, this is my song, my Savior all the day long. Thank you, Ethan. Now, Ethan is an award-winning percussionist, and he could do a lot more than just that on a drum. <laughs> the person that was beating the drum was Ensign Olson from the Salvation Army, and he was walking down the, down the middle of the street in Rogers, Arkansas, and he was singing hymns and beating the drum to invite people to come to a meeting. Brown knew about the Salvation Army. He had actually contributed some money to the Salvation Army because of pretty young woman had asked him to give some money. But he had never participated in a meeting. His friends came out of the cafe and they started to make fun of Ensign Olson. It was a rainy, cold night. He was the only one walking in the middle of the street. But Brown was respectful and quiet because he looked at the dedication of Olson. It was a bone-chilling, cold night. And Olson was the only person on the street and as Brown remembers, that remembers the boom, boom, boom of the drum had such a power over him that he left the restaurant and he followed Olson to the evangelistic meeting. He said to himself, if this man is willing to sing and beat his drum in a night like this, he is something I want. He went to the meetings for several nights before he went forward because he was afraid his friends would make fun of him. On May 15th, 1897, he could wait no longer, and he committed his life to Christ. The lower part of the window shows that story. You see the, um, the beating of the drum, the arm of Olson beating the drum. You see the coins that he used to give because the pretty woman gave, asked him to give some money. You see the tambourine, which was part of worship in the Salvation Army, and the flag in the back is also the Salvation Army. So that's the, that's the symbolism for that part of the window. Now, if you've grown up in an evangelical church like I have, you recognize this story. This is a story of personal testimony, the story of how a person came to repent of their sins, receive Christ, and followed him. And it's good, I think, that Christians tell each other these stories. Uh, they tell friends and even strangers. And I would encourage you to share with one another your story of when and why and how you came to follow Christ. I'd also encourage you to be open to, to hear lots of different ways people have come to Christ. In my upbringing, these testimonials almost always happened at camp around a bonfire. And they had a certain narrative shape to them. Some of you are laughing because you know this, right? The person would get up and then sometimes tell in real detail about how sinful their lives were. I was often amazed and literally quietly jealous of how sinful my 10-year-old friends were. <laughs> how could they sin so much in so few years? 
And then usually they would describe some dramatic event, a death in the family, a car accident, and then they had a complete change and they were this wonderful person following Christ. You know that story. And that narrative certainly is true of some of us. It's the narrative of Saul on the Damascus Road. However, Christ makes himself known in so many more ways and often less dramatic. I often laugh and say, you know, I have BTS, boring testimony syndrome, right? I never wanted to get up at camp. There wasn't anything exciting to talk about. But I have a deep respect for those who speak about their faith as a growing awareness of their commitment to Christ. I know of deeply committed Christians who were baptized as infants and they took on their faith through the process of confirmation in their church. I know of friends who repeated the Jesus prayer at five, but they really didn't come to understand their commitment to Christ until they were 20. I've heard of miraculous stories, particularly among Muslims, where Christ literally comes to them in a vision or a dream and calls them to convert to Christianity. God works in a variety of ways in our life, and we should expect the stories of coming to faith have a variety of shapes and have a variety of details. Listen with grace and generosity to one another as you tell your story to each other of how and when and why you came to follow Christ. In that spirit, let me share you my boring testimony about how I came to Christ. One of the blessings for me is that I grew up in a family of faith. In fact, as I listen to my father speak about the history of our family, I don't think we know of somebody in our family history who wasn't a person of faith. And I grow increasingly thankful for that as I get older. However, my own initial commitment to Christ, and so my own initial commitment to Christ was largely shaped by my family. It happened on August 7, 1970. Yes, I have one of those dates you can put in your Bible that says your second birthday, right? We were on a family vacation in northern Wisconsin. We were staying with my grandparents in a cabin next to a lake. The cabin came with the use of a boat, and my father, my 10-year-old sister, and I were going to go take that boat out, and we are going to go to an island, and we are going to have a camp out. As you might expect as a seven-year-old boy, I could not be more excited than to go on a boat to an island and have a camp out. However, when we came down to the boat, my dad turned it on. He tried to get the motor to tilt back up so we could land on the beach, and the tilt would not work, which means we had to cancel going on the boat to the island. I was desperately disappointed. So my dad, thinking quickly, said, well, we'll just camp here next to the dock with the glow of the windows from the cabin in our background. It was not what I was expecting, but it was the best that we had. So we set up a tent, we collected wood for a campfire, and we sat down to roast our hot dogs and eat our chips. And as we did, my sister started to talk about, she had just been to Bible camp, and she started to talk about her experience at Bible camp. And she talked about a friend who had been saved, who made a commitment to Christ during her time at camp. I was feeling a little bit left out of the conversation, so I just blurted out, I'm saved too. My sister, in all of her fifth grade sophistication and superiority, looked at me quite skeptically. She quickly corrected my theological error and then explained in a matter-of-fact way its significance. She said to me, I don't think you are saved, which means, of course, that you are going to hell And to emphasize her point, she said, it will be as hot as that campfire. (laughs) Now, as you might imagine, as a seven-year-old, I was a little bit shaken by my sister's revelation. And I thought to myself, this day is really going downhill. (laughs) I had woken up that morning with the plans to have an exciting overnight camp on an island, and my sister just informed me that I was going to spend the rest of eternity without God with hellish flames. It was a bad day. My dad wisely intervene, you know, and as many of you have had, he started talking to me, passages from John, passages from Romans, talked to me about what it meant uh, to, my, for my need for salvation, my own sinfulness, which I recognize even as a seven-year-old, uh, about Christ's death and resurrection as the means for my salvation, and about my need to respond to Christ's work in my life and live in obedience. We prayed together that Christ might become Savior and Lord in my life. I was so excited, I ran back to the cabin to tell my mom and my grandparents. And we ended up abandoning the camping trip that night, and I slept in the cabin. There was no dramatic change in my life. I I returned home to second grade. Uh, I went to rec league basketball, right? I went to Sunday school. But I'm still really grateful to be able to point to that conversation 
as the point at which I started to follow Christ. There's been many twists and turns from that point, but that's the point that I started to follow Christ. Moreover, while I'm not quite sure of my sister's motivations in declaring my eternal destiny, I am still really grateful that God placed me in a family that gave witness for my need for Christ. While the shape of each person's story is different, there are some common elements. And John 1, 12 tells us those common elements. First, Jesus initiates the celebration project for all of us. He is the one that comes down to heaven to be born in a manger. He is the light that comes into the world. We experience rebirth not because of the will of man, because of the will of God. Second, he offers salvation to all, but some respond and others do not. John describes those who faithfully respond as those who receive Christ, believe in his name, and become children of God. Let's look at each of those phrases individually. The, rece- the word receive is, is really a very active word in the Greek. It means to take on, to pursue, to lay hold of, to seize When we come to Christ, we take hold of him and the salvation that he offers. When we receive Christ, we purposely align our lives with his identity and his purposes in this world. It's an active response, not a passive response. Think of some analogies. JB accepted you all as students in the the, uh, application process, but you had to take hold of that acceptance. You had to deposit, you had to register for classes, you had to come to campus, you had to go to class. Think about how strange it would be for someone to say they're a student at JBU, but they never went to a class. Similarly, when you're offered a job, you have to take certain actions to receive that offer. You may have to move or sign a contract or show up to a particular location or engage in a certain project to be part of that company. You can't be an employee of Walmart if you never take on the work of Walmart. Similarly, when we receive a Christ, we actively take him on as the source of our identity, purpose, and direction in our life. So first, receive Christ. Second, believe in his name. Believe means confidence, assurance, trust. And the term name is much broader than we think of name. Name we just think of as a word that describes uh, what we call someone. In the Jewish times, that name meant their whole personality, their power, their authority, their action, their feelings, their thoughts. Everything about that person was what their name was. So when you believe in Jesus' name, you have confidence, trust, assurance in his power and his authority and his love and his mercy and his grace. And John in this passage gives us lots of reasons that we can have confidence in who Jesus is. He has been with God from the beginning. He is God. He has created and sustained all things that we see. His life, he is life and his life is the light of the world. His light overcomes the darkness in this world. And he was willing to come down from heaven to live among us as human beings, to live as a human being in order to bring about our salvation. So second, believing in his name. Third, the result is we become children of God. Now, what does that mean? I had a great experience. I've recently, in the last three years, become grandparents. So I've been able to watch parents, not be a parent, but watch parents and how much they love their kids. This summer, Carrie and I were in Wisconsin. My son, oldest son, Chad, and his wife, Anna, have three kids. Uh, here they are. Oops. Okay, so Audrey is three. Yeah, they got an awe picture. That was good. Good response for a grandparent. Yep. Um, and then they had six-month-old twins, Charlie and Emmy. And we, together, we were with them for about three, four weeks this summer, I was reminded again of how much work it is to care for little babies. For the first four or five months of the twins' life, my son Chad would go to bed at 9 o'clock. He'd wake up at 1 or 2 in the morning and he'd take care of the kids until he went to work at 7 and 8. My daughter-in-law, Anna, would stay awake till 1 or 2 in the morning and then she would sleep for four or five hours before she got up when he went to work and she'd take care of the babies for the rest of the week, rest of the day. Collectively, the twins ate 12 to 14 times a day. They had their diapers changed 20 times a day. They have six to eight changes of clothes a day. They have mounds of laundry, just like mounds of laundry. It's exhausting work and completely involves all sorts of self-sacrifice. My son, 
who loves to go to the gym has been in the gym for six months. And unfortunately, it shows. Uh, <laughs> he's not here. He won't hear this. Anna, Anna rarely gets out of the house. And of course, they, with a lack of sleep, they're grumpy sometimes and they miss their personal time. But what's remarkable is how much joy and love they have for their kids. These two, hate, these two helpless babies that demand almost everything from them. They love to make the da- babies laugh or coo. They celebrate the smallest accomplishment. The baby rolls over and you would have thought, you know, you had won the lottery or something. It's like everybody's shouting. Moreover, we take such... We take such pleasure in seeing the family resemblance. Who looks like who, right? My three-year-old granddaughter is very much like her dad and very much like her grandmother. Uh, She loves to jump on a trampoline, super active. She also loves to do puzzles. Charlie there, the boy on on the right, he's actually, his name is Charles William Pollard V. And this summer, we actually had the opportunity to take a picture with the four of the five, uh, Charles Williams. So those are four of the five of us. My, obviously, my grandfather's no longer with us. Another example about how parents love their kids, and, you, and many, most of you are not parents, right? When you're a parent and you go to the kid's concert and you walk into a big auditorium like this, the first thing you do is look for your kid. When you go to a game and you see all the players on the sideline, the first thing you do is you look for your kid. Today, I know my son is sitting back there. When you walked into this room, if you're a child of God, God looked for you. He looked for you because you're your, your his child. The God of the universe cares for us with more joy and sacrifice than even parents of newborn twins. He delights in seeing himself in us when our actions and our character reflect his identity. He would do anything to bring about good in our lives and protect us from evil, including being willing to die for us. Even though we are as helpless and demanding as babies, he still longs to spend time with us and finds joy in our presence. We are the beloved children of the living God, and that reality should define every aspect of who you are. Of course, perhaps the most remarkable thing about God's love for us is that he was willing to become a helpless babe himself to bring about our gift of salvation. The image at the top of the window shows that. There we go. You can see the three posts in the bottom uh, kind of pillar there that represent the manger, the stable which Jesus is born. And then you see the manger with the straw representing Christ's first bed. The image of the star that the wise men followed to find and worship Jesus. And then the letters I-H-S. Those are actually the traditional Greek abbreviation for the name of Jesus there. God who has existed for all time was willing to come down and submit himself to living in time. God, who has created the whole world, was willing to become a helpless baby that could not take care of himself. God, who is the source of all life, was willing to become human and willing to die. God, who is the light of the world, was willing to engage the ultimate darkness of this world and defeat it. All of that so that you could become a child of God. Now some of you may be hearing this good news for the first time this morning. Or some of you may have heard this good, to, good news time and time again. But for the first time, it seems to be about you. If you're curious to learn more about how you might receive Christ, believe in his name, and become a child of God, I would encourage you to come speak with me or with Tracy or Frank or Jen or some faculty and staff here. We would love to talk to you about that. There is not a more important conversation you could have at the beginning of this semester. On the other hand, I expect that many, if not most of you, somewhere along in your life made a decision to receive Christ. You may have had a dramatic conversion or you may have slowly grown into the, your understanding of who it is to be a child of God. But either way, you're sort of sitting here thinking, yeah, great stories and everything else, but how does this, how's this story relate to me? Again, I think the window and 1 John helps us, the windows. Notice that in our 10 windows, there's only one window that talks about conversion. And there's nine under windows that talk about the results of that conversion. The way in God has used the results in the life of John Brown Sr., 
to bring about his light in this world through the education of this institution, which has educated 14,000 students over the last 100 years. He, all, he wants us to bear witness to how we came to Christ, but he also wants us to bear witness to how we are partnering with him to bring light into the darkness of this world. And we know too well that this world is full of darkness. Mass shootings in schools or at Walmart. We just got a text from our daughter right before chapel. And 20% of the kids at her school did not come to school today because they're scared about a shooting. There's no particular threat, but they're just scared. Refugees are fleeing violence and oppression with nowhere to go. There's increased in incidence of anxiety and depression amongst us, young people and old. Political and social media conversations are just filled with angry insults and half-truths. And then there's just the regular, ongoing, bone-crushing sorrow of sickness and poverty and hunger and death that's just a part of the human condition. But, what's wonderful about the Christian faith is always a but. Even as we recognize the darkness, followers of Christ do not lose hope. We've taken hold of Jesus. We believe in his name. We are his children. And we know that Jesus is the light that the darkness cannot overcome. Let me give you a few examples how you, some of you in the room, and some of our alumni, are partnering with Jesus to bring light into this world. So a couple pictures. First, and you see, I didn't remember this, but all the nurses are dressed up in the scrubs. Our nurses went to Guatemala and to uh, Malawi this summer. That's the group in Guatemala. In particular, two stories. One story, this, the, the, uh, the nurses were with a mother who didn't realize right, that she had a breast infection and that her, that her child was actually not getting enough nourishment. Uh, they did a quick diagnosis. They quickly brought her to a clinic and likely saved this, the, that child's life. In another situation, they had a child who had a very severe cleft palate. Again, this is part of the darkness of the world that we have sickness and, and, and illness. And to the point, again, the child was not getting proper nourishment. They were able to connect the child with some potential places for surgery, but they also dug into their own pockets and they bought special bottles that would enable that uh, baby to be able to take on nourishment. Then we had st some nursing students in Malawi. They were there for about a week to 10 days. They met with over 450, 450 people in that week or 10 days, people that did not have regular access to medical care. So great work done by some of our nursing students. Then we have a student here, Rosita. Rosita lives in Guatemala. She's organized 20 to 25 volunteers in her hometown, and they go teach English to young children. Learning English brings about all sorts of economic opportunity in Guatemala. Uh, and she's, a, I think, a sophomore here. So bringing light to her hometown by helping others teach people about English. Our digital cinema students this summer were in our, Ireland, and they did a documentary, and they interviewed people that were part of the peace and reconciliation movement in Northern Ireland to talk about how Northern Ireland has turned from the violence uh, between Catholics and Protestants and give witness to how the light has been brought back to Northern Ireland in that particular situation. Then uh, one of our students, Olivia, became in third in the nation in the Nats competition, right? Singing beautifully brings beauty into a world full of darkness. Then this summer, I was on a variety of alumni trips, and I decided that Tara and I were in Denver on a Sunday, and we decided we'd go to a church. And we, one of our board members has a daughter that goes to that church, to a church downtown, and said, well, go, go there. And, and we walked into the church. It's called the Heights Church. Uh, and as we were walking up the steps, um, that's the church on the left, we were walking up the steps, some person came out to me and said, President Potter, what are you doing here? And I was like, I, you know, this is really hard, so give me grace when you do this to me in five years. Like, I'm like, I don't know who you are. What are you saying? I don't know what. And she goes, my 
brother-in-law and sister are actually the pastors here, uh, Corbin and Abby Hobbs. Uh, and so we talked for a little while. We walked in, met another couple from JBU that was there. And then we were sitting there in the congregation. We looked at the band, and the woman there on the left, on the picture on the left, she was, she was playing the drums. And we know her. She used to play JBU basketball, and plus she's married to... Uh, to, uh, her name's Brittany, and she's married to Jonathan Frias, who is our second son's, uh, one of his best friends. So I'm texting Jonathan, I said, I think I'm looking at your wife playing the drums in church, where are you? Uh, and he said, I'm parking the car. And all of a sudden, there was about 15 or 20, about 15 or so JBU students in a church of about 110 in downtown Denver, trying to be a light for Christ in downtown Denver. This church started in a coffee shop. Uh, and they have all sorts of outreach to their community. Uh, and I was just so encouraged to see some of our alumni doing that. And then we had an alumni event in uh, Los Angeles. And the guy on the left there, this was from an old Christmas dance that we had. He graduated. His name is Travis Nelson. He graduated in 2009. So he comes to the alumni event. There was about 25 people in the room. And the next, he was graduating in 2009, the next youngest person graduated in 1974. So you can figure out, the poor guy walked in and he thought to himself, oh, I made a mistake. This is, I shouldn't have come here. But of course, he was the only guy I knew because he was the only one who graduated during our time. So I went up and I started to talk to him. I said, Travis, how are you doing? What are you up to? He goes, I got married. I moved out here. And we just had an eight-month-old baby. And then we have 15-year-old twin sons. And I'm an English major. I'm not good in math, but I've tried. So 2009, 15 years old. You weren't in student discipline. How, what, how is, what, what, what are you talking about? And he goes, well, when we first started in our church together as a couple, they had a ministry to foster care kids at a camp. And we went to the camp. And I met one of these twins. And then we started to, they started to come over once a month, and his brother came, and then he started to come once every two weeks, and then they started to stay on the weekend. And, and then my wife and I looked at him, and they, we said to ourselves, they've been in the foster care system for most of their lives. They need a family. Maybe we should be their family. So they, in 2017, they adopted two 13-year-old boys. They have the weirdest conversations. He goes down and talks to their coach, and the coach looks at him like, who are you? I'm their dad. And you know what? He doesn't sugarcoat it. He told, told me, he goes, it has been the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. I am not prepared to be the father of a 14-year-old. But it's the most important thing that God's given me to do. He has aligned his character and identity with the light of Christ and brought light into the darkness for those boys. And they brought great joy to him, Right? As we bring light, we receive light from those that we are engaged with. So, in May 1897, John Brown Cedar heard the beat of a drum and it changed his life forever. Who could have imagined that the beat of that drum would continue on in the ministry of JBU some 120 years later? The beat goes on in the work of JBU nursing students. The beat goes on in Rosita's organizing volunteers to teach people English. The beat goes on in the beauty of Olivia's voice. The beat goes on in our digital cinema students documenting peace and reconciliation. The beat goes on in a church in downtown Denver. The beat goes on in the Nelsons adopting those two twin boys. And the beat goes on in the worship today here at JBU. JBU, let us continue to hear the beat of the drum. Not just to tell of our witness of coming to Christ and how we became his child, but also how we partner with him to bring light into the darkness of this world. And let us continue to do that until he comes again. May it always be true of us at JBU. Amen.
Thanks for listening to this episode of the John Brown University Chapel Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes or whatever platform you're listening on, and we'd love it if you would leave us a review.